you know. Well, we're kind of Luddites compared to play on social media. Look at my hair. I need a haircut, man. Yeah, when we were on Dr. Phil, she hair in a canned me. You remember the hell? You I were just, there. You saw it. Yeah, you just she got sprayed spots. me right there, my a little I'm right there, I'm missing hair. She's like, Scott, I said, let me just tell I said, oh, no, are you going to hair in the can me? She said, just a little bit. I said, all right. Every time she talks to me, I just, she calls me baby. And when she does, it just makes me shut up and do whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. When we went there, if you're listening in, when we went when we went there, Scott went to hair and makeup, and I, of course, went to makeup. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. Um, okay, Adele, right out of the gate, she wants to know what SEER stands for. S-E-R-E. Greg, you want to answer yeah, so that one? SEER is it's survival, meaning how do I find food, how do I kill animals, all that kind of stuff. And remember, what we're doing is we're teaching people who are in high-risk situations what to do if they get behind enemy lines dropped, if, they get, if you know there's movement and they get overrun, that kind of thing. So they have to learn to survive have to learn to evade capture, to resist interrogation, and to escape. So we put them through an exercise where they go and learn to, you know, they go into kill class to learn to kill chickens and rabbits and that kind of stuff. And then they learn to make traps and fish, fishing line, and all that kind of thing. And we teach them how to hide, how to get away. And then we drop them off in the woods for a period of time and they run and we chase them and try to capture them and they hide. And if they manage to hide long enough, then we contrive their capture and force them into a capture point. So that was the survival, the evasion piece running from someone. They're trying to hide and, and not be detected. Then they get in, they meet interrogators, and that's where I was working in the compound. And we use interrogation techniques used by our enemies in the past. So they get the chance to use resistance techniques that they've been taught to try to avoid giving up information. And they are supposed to learn to escape but not try. So it's a, it's a really complex course. It's really tough physically. Uh, most folks I know who have been through ranger school or any other school will say they'd rather go back to ranger school than go through it because it puts you under so much duress that I think the average weight loss we found there was between 15 and 20 pounds in the short period of time you're in the class. So, yeah, wow. high duress. All right, you're up. Okay, let's see. I'll start working from here. What are the benefits of, this is from Gwen, what are the benefits of body language versus statement analysis? Well, I don't think they're separate. You know, we do a little bit of listening to words. We're not Peter Hyatt. We're not, you know, that. We're not the AI that, that can do statement analysis. But what we are looking for, if you ever notice, is we're looking for, when I talk about how someone's speaking, I talk about diction, choice of words. Why does that word not fit the rest of their vocabulary? If it's out of place, it means something. I look at tense. I look at a lot of other things, but I'm not a statement analysis person who's looking at the mechanics of their structure and where it changes. I'm doing it in real time and listening. And I don't think that one or the other is better or worse than the other. I think all of these things together help us to be better investigators and try to get to the truth. So for example, what Peter Hyatt does certainly brings value on a level of that's different from what we're doing. All of it, they're all different channels. To be a good interrogator, you need to know a little bit of body language, a little bit about how people put sentences together and structure them. When we're talking to a person, we've done planning and prep to know what their background is and where they come from. So we know a little bit about their personality and what their likes and dislikes are. We're looking at facts and everything we know about the situation. So the interrogator is kind of the point of the spear. It may not be a master of every one of those things, but usually knows a little bit about each. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, I think I think they're both both really important. I couldn't be just uh, the statement analysis person because so much comes along with seeing that statement being made and seeing how that person reacts uh, to that question. So Peter Hyatt's great at that. He can go in and just microscope the crap out of that stuff and get up in it. But I like the I like the combination of both. Now I'm not studied in 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 um, in Peter's stuff, but. For the body language part of it, you, you've got to see what somebody is doing. That's the way I feel about it, and to make those, they sort of go together. That's why a lot of times Peter gets, comes up with some stuff and he nails it, and I don't, it's, I don't see how he does it without being able to see the person actually answering it. He can just look at what they've said and do it. But I, but they're, I think they're important, and I think they're parallel, and they go together really well. But for me... Personally, I, it's, it's a combination of the two heavier on body language than the statement analysis itself. So, uh, all right. 
Then how about, um, oh, here's Patrick Shortle. Shortle, a uh, question for Scott. I was wondering uh, what editing program you use for the behavior panel. How do you find editing the videos now compared to the when you started? I was just wondering because I'm an editor myself. Uh, okay. Well, then, if you're an editor and you can call yourself an editor, you're already four years ahead of the game, uh, 4,000 miles in front of me on this because I'm still learning how to do it. We, I use um, Final Cut Pro. And so I'm, we just go on Zoom like this, and then we record it. And then after that, I just put in Final Cut Pro and then cut it up and, and add these little things I make in Keynote. That's what the, uh, the our, our South Park cheap-looking style intros all are that. And without having to worry about music, I just whistled. So we have a little whistle at the top. And that's that's pretty much it. And then, and then I learned how to do a thing where you drop in our old videos – I didn't know how to make a, I don't know what you call it, where you put it over it so you have the colors and stuff on the outside. Right now, and when this thing going live, it's just all black on the outside. But I learned how to make one of those things into a ping so you can drop it on top of the thing so it looks like there's something else going on. Like we have green around it. In this case, we have yellow around it and little boxes and things. So that's probably about as far as it's going to go. But Plus, I've learned how to get, how to get the audio out and then uh, be able to master that and then stick it back in with a video. So that is all I got. I, we, I don't know anything about transitions. Can't do that. I see it, and I did it a couple <laughs> of times, but I forgot how to do it, I, and, and I just don't have that. I'm not that, that kind of person. So my hat's off to you. I have no earthly idea what I'm doing still. To the, as you've seen on this, we were in here, we get in here five, ten minutes early and just talk because I want to make sure everything is where it should yeah. be on this. What's the chance so, to catch up on some things too? Uh, Maria yeah. asked, do, do you find there's any region of the US with more straightforward verbal and nonverbal body language <clears throat> or any region with less straightforward language for the sake of social cu cultural politeness? So I'll hop on this one for a minute and then Scott, let you jump in. I've lived in 11 states, if I remember right. I was a soldier, I joined the army when I was young, but most of my friends when I was a soldier and folks that are listening in that our friends who were soldiers would tell you, I had lots of civilian friends wherever I was at because I did theater and horses and that kind of thing. What I found is my opinion, now let, let me tell you, I've lived in California, lived in Monterey, lived in Arizona, around Tucson. I've lived in North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, New Jersey, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, probably missing somewhere in there. Uh, and worked a lot in the Midwest, worked in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, all those places. What, in my opinion, the most direct in body language and in speech is the Northeast. When I first moved to the Northeast, it was amazing to me how direct people could be. And they would say things, I, I'd say to them sometimes, that would get you in a fist fight in the South because where I grew up, people are polite even when they don't mean it until they're not. And then you've got this whole thing called Minnesota nice, where Minnesotans are so polite and they don't mean a word of it. So it's it's an interesting kind of thing. I, I think it evolved. It evolved maybe because the Northeast is such a huge melting pot of people. You need to be more direct for people to get your message. The South, God knows the Civil War probably had some effect on how Southerners treated people after the war and how they dealt with occupation and that kind of, so cultures, there's a lot to our culture that caused us to be where, at. in my opinion, the most straightforward is the Northeast and then probably the least straightforward maybe the south or minnesota and i'm not saying they're being deceptive they're just polite that's it scott what do you got i got nothing to add to that i'm with you um here's one again for me i'm just uh, scoot through these is what i'm seeing my name on this one first scott do you want to say you're an empath in my perception it's quite uh, uh, it's quite the opposite. Please comment. I might have said I was before we started this. I asked Greg because I found out I'm an EN, ENTP. No, I think she's saying you once said you're not an empath. Oh, not an empath. So mean, what's an empath? She doesn't mean that. That means a person who feels what other people feel. I mean, there's more to it than that, I'm sure. I don't yeah. you know, know all the details of that, but that's what she's asking. I okay. I, I do that, but I'm not on, a, I'm not on a heavy level. I'm an ENTP. So Greg just explained to me what that is, and my wife explains it to me every time I ask her too. But it's just there's so many things <laughs> going on in there. It. Yeah, my dyslexic brain can't hold on to it and keep it all in, in the uh, structure it should be in. So 
So I don't know if I'm an empath or not. I guess does that mean I am? If I'm in ENTP, I'm not. No, that I? all, all that's just a sorting thing for being able to talk about people is what I think of all those sorting tools. That's just one of the more the more pronounced ones is Myers Briggs. There are others for sorting people. I mean, there's the disc and all those other different ways you use in business. <clears throat> Brian, you ask a good question. How important is the use of Maslow's hierarchy? Is it used in interrogation? Well, Greg, you want me Greg, to Greg bases his minutes. life on that. So yeah. I do, I do. Yeah. I'm gonna get some coffee. I'll be right back. And we can run to the store. <laughs> yeah, if you want me to, if you want me to geek, there's the spot to get me to geek on is Maslow's hierarchy. So I'll just say this: Is it used in interrogation? Every one of those ploys, every one of those things in interrogation, all 14 ploys used or approaches used in intelligence interrogation are levers to move a person around inside Maslow. And I was just talking to Scott, we're going to do a review, uh, a book review on my Get People to Do What You Want, which is based entirely on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it, it took me 20 years of doing that work before, <laughs> thanks Scott, it took me 20 years of doing that work to figure that out, that all we're doing is moving a person between belong and differentiate or belong and esteem, we're either impacting their self-esteem or we're boosting their self-esteem or we're slicing them off from their prisoner population and making them bond with us so they have to build esteem with us so yeah it's really powerful it is the single most and it's not that it's maslow's hierarchy it's that the person needs to belong and they need to create esteem and you're levering and taking advantage of that when you're interrogating somebody scott you got something else you want to add to that no you're the king of that i'm not getting close to it <laughs> uh have you ever inter this is from a gene covert have you ever interrogated someone or interviewed someone with disassociation identity disorder if so, which personalities during question? I haven't. I haven't. If you want to see one that is a famous example of that, go look up Arthur Shaw Cross. And that's one of the cases that I that the lady who who um, Hallmark that actually used is Arthur Shaw Cross. And he's a monster. I mean, in no terms do I call people monster casually. That guy's a monster. If you go watch him, he does that. And he, I, I, I call BS. Because I would imagine, I've never been in the situation, but if you're talking to somebody who is truly switching personalities, he wouldn't say, I'm his mother, and he does in this case. And I'm like, hold on. If you're his mother, you wouldn't be saying, I'm his mother. You would say, boom. You know, that's So there are places in there that I think he's not above board, but that's just my opinion. And nope, if, I've ever, if I'd ever seen one, I don't remember it or didn't recall that's what was going on. Okay. Did you watch that? Did you see V for Vendetta? Because I was just scrolling through and oh, saw yeah, the question yeah, again. Yeah. It's a good movie. Good movie. Yeah. What's it about? Yeah. Uh, it, in effect, it's kind of a anti-government guy, and it's you know it's kind of this anonymous. It's been a long time for me to put it in words, but it's it's kind of an anonymous movement against the government, and that's he takes over all this stuff. It's like the anonymous person who's taking down all this kind of stuff. Oh, well, Maria says, uh, so I think you could write a relationship chapter, maybe a whole book on Maslow's hierarchy because of the two people aren't in the same place or don't understand where the other is. They are not going to connect well. Did you already do it? You got a book you wrote a dating on book for women. A dating book oh, for women. Yeah. <laughs> figures. So, yeah. Um, Stephen asks, you ever do SEER training in the Airway Heights, Washington? Nope. I was a brag guy. I was the Army guy. We usually said... Uh, and I did know those guys. I worked with a couple of them out of there because they were a proponent agency. The Air Force, of course, has more people at risk of being captured than anybody because of downed pilots. So the, in my days, they were a proponent agency, and they would come to our course and check us out. And they had dedicated SEER instructors. It was as a MOS, as a job, whereas we were interrogators who were good at interrogating. They brought in to do that, along with some survivalists and that kind of thing. Great question. Jamie, our our our, our what? Uh, asks why do y'all wear black and Chase and Mark don't, and do you switch frames on here versus the behavior panel? Uh, I I wear it because it's thinning. <laughs> I think we early on said that when we do body language tactics, we are just kind of going to wear black shirts. It's kind of our uniform. You, yeah. you got to know that I'm I'm mentally the laziest guy you're ever going to meet. In my corporate gig, I wear white shirts because I don't have to think about what color everything else is and it just works. So the black t-shirt works here. And I try to switch it up once in a while on the behavior panel. We don't switch panels, we don't switch locations because we have to remember who we're pointing to and yeah. it would make it difficult every time to point in the right direction. And people have told us it annoys them when we move around on the panel. Yeah, so. but on here right now, what you're seeing, 
And it, when you're actually seeing it live, if you're not watching the replay, then you're seeing a switched because when I, this is what I'm seeing is the reverse of what you see. If that sounds right. So when I, well, you're when you're here I, for me, uh, what I'm set up today? Oh, yeah. oh, really? No, you're over. Yeah. You're over here. Well, here to me, but you're really over there. Yeah, I think that's what it looks like. On when it's, let's see, it's really over there. Wait a minute, I'll see where I'm pointing. Oh, well. While you're doing that, I'll tell Sadie, do you prefer to do interrogations alone or in pairs? It depends. It depends for me. Scott and I interviewed Don Wells and others. We actually, you'll, you'll find out shortly because it's being advertised everywhere. We also talked to Candace and we did that as a pair. That was interesting and we're good partners in that. We didn't, we didn't have time to coordinate in the first one, but the second one, we got a little more coordination. And I will tell you that some of my best interrogations have been partnered with someone. But it just depends on the person and what your approach is going to be and how you plan to go after it. What it does allow you to do is I can poke on the person while Scott's thinking and vice versa. So we get time to think about our next question or to set up some approach we're running to. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that was and the thing is, it's such an organic thing when you get in there. It's good to have somebody you can work off of. So it's and I know where Greg's going. He knows where I'm going. And he'll set like he'll set something up like almost like that. And I'll. Dock, and, or he will as well go okay here it is honk and he'll jump back and you just get in and you'll see that happen on dr phil you'll actually see that going on you'll if you watch it twice you'll go oh i guess exactly what they're doing yep. and and they probably will too but yep. uh yeah For sure we can talk about that because that's on the commercial already right yeah just no we, just, we won't go into great detail today you just know that we're going to next week there'll be a, more on the on the summer wells case on dr phil and we'll leave yeah, it at that. Yeah. We won't go into too much detail, steal his thunder, but yeah, a couple of couple of days of shows should be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Sonny, you say I am an ENFP. Oddly enough, so am I by Myers Briggs speaking. Of course, that's self reported and it's only as good as whatever you say. But yeah, I, every time I've ever taken it came out that way. And that's not a common person in business operations where I spent twenty years of my life or in the military. So uh hi. Uh let's see. Uh uh, which is a question. Oh, uh, question. How did you all get into this unusual vocation and what keeps you going? Well, I got into it because it just fascinated me. Always be, always like, uh, what is it? I'm an ENF. What am I, Greg? I'm an EF and <laughs> whatever I am. It's, yeah, I'm the debater or whatever. And it's not that I like to fuss with people. I really don't like it. I love it. No, I, I like to, um, I like it because you, you get somebody to tell you something they don't want to tell you, especially if they've done something they shouldn't have done, then that's the good part about that. But being able to, 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 make, to make somebody really angry really quickly or calm them down really quickly, there's an art to that. And after a while, you, get, you, you learn how to do those things. Like Greg can, can look and be the meanest dude in the whole wide world, but then he can be just like a, a giant sweetheart wrapped in a monster. <laughs> so it, I, I like it because, and and find it fascinating because you you get to talk to all kinds of different people. They've done all kinds of different things, and it's it's getting in that their head and getting them to to and turning that around and making them feel okay about telling you all about it. Giving giving getting them to give themselves permission to to say here's what I did, and you making them feel like it's going to be okay, and that's the thing they should do. I've always been fascinated with making people tell me something they didn't want to know that that they didn't want anybody to know. Not like tell me your secrets, not like that stuff. But if you did something, or you suspected, even as a kid, if you suspected somebody doing something, talking to them, getting them to tell you about it. And after a while, and I guess I got good at doing that, not manipulating them, but persuading them to to let me know what they did. That's the part. And then being able to add the body language part to that sort of comes naturally because after a while you get used to the way somebody acts or in general, there are no absolutes in this. So you, in general, you get an idea of how people act when they're uncomfortable and you'll see people do a lot of the same things. So you start piecing those together and that took years and years and years. I mean, growing up doing that. So that's why I like it. It seems like it just kind of falls into place for me. It seems, it seems natural. Greg, what about you? Yeah, so I stumbled into it, as I always say. You know, I always had a thing where I, I have a sense for people. It's funny. I'm going to answer two questions at once. Someone says, I would have thought you were an I. It's, that's interesting. If you talk to anybody around me, I talk to everybody I meet. I, I like people. And people make me nuts sometimes because they do stupid things. But 
what drew me to it is in the beginning, I had the sense for people, kind of a feeling, you know, I, I, when I was interrogating, I'd know what to say. I would know, you know, to get that person to talk. And I started noticing at SEER because at SEER, we wrote the story and we're interviewing and asking questions about that story of people who are trying to hide it. So we know when they're lying because we wrote the story. So we get to watch their body language. And I started making notes and paying attention, went to a couple of seminars, and then it just jumped off a plate at me. I got to start learning this. And I had my own words for what I was seeing and started learning some of the other words that people use for it. And that was a long time ago when body language was just kind of really getting started. And I think my first book was The Naked Ape. Got me started and interested in it. Read that a long time ago. And then Desmond Morris's Man Watching and then you know, all those kinds of books led me to go that way. The the part for me, Scott, you hit dead on it. What I think interrogators and hypnotists and all of us have in common or CI guys is we give that other person permission or a safe space to do whatever it is we want them to do is how we get it. But reading them and knowing whether you got it right or not is a big part of that because you can push too far. You can push just a step too far and then you lose them. So you got to be able to, I call it threshold thinking, which NTs are good at, by the way is push just enough so that they don't push back and you have to be able to read body language to do it and kay um, asks go oh ahead. go ahead oh she yeah, is, this is good answer, one for you. this is good one for you oh, what are you going to answer go ahead yeah i was going to answer john's question because i see you ask a couple of times do either of you have advice for someone wanting to train and train others at seer school john if you know somebody's going to join and they join the air force the air force has an mos or a job you can sign up for to be a SEER instructor. I mean, it's a job and they're junior people doing it because it's a specialty, an, an occupational specialty for them. If you go in the army, you have to be an interrogator or a Green Beret or a ranger to work at the school. So it depends on which part you're trying to do. If you're trying to do the survival piece in the army, you need to be a Green Beret or a ranger. If you're gonna do the interrogation resistance piece, you probably need to be an interrogator. And I'd also say, if you're gonna go through the army, you gotta go through the course first. You probably have to go through the course there, so buckle up. Because it's it's one of the worst courses you'll ever go through in your life. Yep. Okay. Yeah, Sear School, man. I could talk about like I know. Yeah, you know, I don't know anything about. It. I don't don't know anything about it. I, I had a buddy who had a civilian version of it, and people signed up for it left and right. Kind of crazy. What were they going to use it for? Oh, it just they didn't get any training in resistance. It was just a nasty. Oh. Oh. Weekend of hell. So. <laughs> oh, you've told me that story. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, I'll keep that one off the path, but yeah. Uh, Suzanne Fisher uh, says, any advice on doing, dealing with a teenager who's exhibiting behaviors of a narcissist, possibly borderline personality? That's professional help you need. Yeah, we, yeah, we're YouTube us. people for when it comes to that. Yeah, don't, don't go, go get that look, uh, check into that. You know, we could say, oh, this, that, and the other thing, but even though we do know some about that, I'm not even going to touch that because you should get right. a professional, you professional to help you with thing. that. Yeah. yeah, and guys, remember what I always say, we're not psychologists. We're psychology techs at best. You know, what we're doing is using tools to identify people, to go after them with levers and to get information. Our job is not to diagnose. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, I'm sure you'll notice, I'm, I try really hard to stay away from diagnosing anybody with anything. I say they, they exhibit behaviors of, and then that gives me a lever. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Man, there's a Good bunch question, of Julie here. asks. Julie asks in daily life using body language to give you more control as a form of manipulation. When do you feel it crosses into bad behavior? I, I often will say if you're using it for your gain and the other person's demise, that's bad behavior. That's bad yeah. behavior. If you're using it to help another person or to get something done for common good, different. And sometimes common, remember, when we're doing this stuff, if you saw us in the interrogation room interrogating someone, you wouldn't like us as much because we come across as nasty. We, and I don't mean yelling because we don't. I try. My first thing I'm going to try to do anytime I talk to somebody is get them to smile because I'm building rapport doing that. But then you have to turn on them and go after information. And sometimes that's unpleasant and makes people really not like you. So... If you think that I look mean, it, there's a benefit to that. I always say I'm probably the nicest guy you're ever going to meet in your life. I just have a nasty demeanor. So, it it, 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 here's the weird part about that. Uh, after, after you watch Doctor Phil, you're going to like Greg a whole lot more than you're going to like me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, mm. Got another question? Oh well. Let's see. Uh, 
There's a bunch of them in here. I'm trying not to do I don't know which ones you've asked and and, and haven't when it came to. I was going to ask see one from uh, hmm. Let's see. There's a good one from Valerie, a good one from Ask do that one then. Okay. And then Anna, you can read that one that talks about Guy Fox night. So they're going to have good bonfires tonight. Wish I were there. Long time, uh, Valerie says, long time listener, first time caller. In the Rebecca Fenton analysis, Greg mentioned that all the lines in her face maybe has to do with a lot of trauma. So, is there ways that people with childhood trauma leak? Yeah. So, the, the big thing is, it doesn't have to be trauma. In her case, it looks like a lot of anger and emotion and all of that. And that, you know, what you use your face for leaves lines. You can see these furrows in my brow probably mean that I've done a lot of that and I have done a lot of that in my life. But you also see I use my forehead a lot, so it leaves wrinkles. Corners of my eyes are wrinkled. Age is part of it, but there are plenty of people my age without all that that haven't done Botox, so it just leaves that. People, whether they're children or any other kind of trauma, are going to show if they've been sad a lot. They're going to have downturned sides of their mouth. Um, they're going to have you know those creases. They'll have wrinkles in places that show pain. And so that's just because muscle memory freezes that stuff that way. I always say your mama was right when she said your face is going to freeze that way. It just takes it a long time to do it. So just look for all those lines and you'll know kind of. You also can see people who are happy, who smile a lot because they have smile lines in that. Yeah. Okay. And Kay Marum asks, uh, which uh, segment of the general population is most likely to benefit financially from reading body language? In my experience, I would say the in the entrepreneurial world, um, anywhere though, really. I mean, for entrepreneurs, you can you need to be um, transmitting the right body language, but you need to be able to to read the body language that you're transmitting those people to to see how they're reading you. For example, most entrepreneurs when they're pitching are under the impression that the person if there's a bunch of people there, if you're in front of you know five, ten, fifteen, even five hundred, sometimes that was some of the things we do at the Entrepreneur Center here in Nashville, and. They're, they'll think the the person you want to start pitching to is the person that looks like this. They want to pitch to that person. They keep looking at them. That's the last person you want to pitch to because they're not interested even a little bit in what you're talking about. They're there schmoozing or they're there because somebody said, listen, my kid is going to be pitching this thing down there. This guy in our company is going to be pitching our thing. Will you please go watch? It? Oh, yeah, I'll go down there. And they'll go down and just watch. The person you want to focus on in, in that um arena in that area is the person who looks the total opposite of what you think they should look like. Everybody thinks they should be going, hmm, like that. What you want is somebody who looks like this. Data intake. Yeah, they're thinking, is this, because they're running numbers, they're saying, is this going to, are they going to be able to do what they say they're going to be able to do? Is this person fully, are they going to, is in two years, this is going to happen just like they said it was. What about that financial guy there standing over there? I wonder if he's worth a hoot. I don't know any of these people. I'm wondering what I'm so they're thinking that's what you want because those are the people who are actually going over what you're talking about in their head as you're talking about it and are going over things you've, you've said. A lot of times you'll see them with their legs crossed with a, with a, with a, a pad of paper and a pen and they'll, they'll write some stuff down. Sometimes they won't write it down at all. It just looks like they've got a bunch of barriers there and they do because they're not part of the show for you at that point. They're part of checking you out and, and making decisions about you. So that's what you want to look for. In my experience, those are the people that, that do well financially using body language. Yeah. So I, I, for 20 years, I have, I have a corporate career too. And for 20 years, I've done everything from be a construction manager where it made me money because I would know when somebody's BSing me and get past that, know when it was time for pressure, when it was time to back away. I, from that to being a business improvement guy to running a PL, I did all of that. And in every one of those cases, this helped because I would have somebody come in, a great example, when I was running construction, I'd have project um, subcontractors come in. There was one I will never forget who would <clears throat> clear his throat every time he was gonna ask for a change order. And if you know what that means, he's asking for more money. I would just usually get ahead of him and say, hey man, I got no more money in this job. I hope you don't need anything. And he would just stop right there. So that was all the way back there. And then when you get to corporate side, then you've got all this entitlement and everybody in their different camps, all the P&L leaders and all the, the functional business leaders and HR and finance and legal all have their vested interests. And you, being able to read and know what's going on in the room with you is powerful. And then doing due diligence for private equity, as I've done, walking in, knowing where to push, where a person's looking uncertain, or if a person is hedging 
because you can be truthful without being honest. And being knowing body language gives you the opportunity to know where to probe and where to ask questions. So I think from a financial point of view, if you're in business, it can't hurt you. It's a great, it is a great tool. I've used it for 20 years in business. Here's one from Kathy Utley. And uh, she says, I don't know if others are having, having this experience, but I can tell if a guy's attracted to me. It's great for my ego. Here's how you know if, if you're a girl and there's a guy that's attracted to you, when they see you, you'll see their eyebrows go do, do this. Uh, not like, dang, not really quickly, but really slowly they'll go up yeah, no. and they'll stay up. <laughs> yeah. Especially as you talk to them, they'll, they'll go up and stay up while you're talking Pupil to them. That's the biggest too. one. Pupil oh, yeah. Too. Yeah. Yep. But that's the number that's the number one cue. If you're seeing like the psychopathic stare from across the room and they're just doing this, they're just looking at you. You know, that's one thing with those eyebrows are up and they stay up and almost like a blank look on their face, then they're taken by you or with you. So <laughs> but the eyebrows up, that's definitely they're interested. So Kay asks a great question. Which behavior panel analysis has been your most complex to date? I can usually follow along, but in the show about Cleo's parents, I was wrong, wrong, wrong about everything. Well, Okay, that is, in my opinion, the most complex one we have done because there's cultural difference. There's nuance of the person's bone structure and face. There's a ton of stuff in there that look like red flags. And the reason we w went about bringing out those red flags is to point out here they are, but they don't mean anything. And I'm telling you, it's the subtlety of her, the ability to show anger without being angry, without being a jerk, to show anger in her face and then contempt in flash flash micro expressions and i'm not the big micro expression guy is what turned my turn the tide for me and made me start looking it's i think easy for us most of us jump to conclusions when a child is involved especially because our nature is to protect children that's human nature unless something is wrong that's human nature and for us to also automatically assume someone in the family did it because it's so hard to hide and i think that projection is very difficult to overcome so yeah, that was one of the more complex ones. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you 100% because for a while there, man, I was right down the middle because everything was as it should be. But then you saw all these flags. But then again, I'm not going down that. I don't. Joe Navarro, number one thing, you got to decide what you're seeing is the the body language you're seeing. Is it um, limbic or is cultural. it cultural? Yeah. And I'm totally going limbic. I'm like, I got this one. And then I would see these things and go, what the hell is that? But it was totally uh cultural things so but i but we still said here's right here, here are red flags a lot of people are seeing some of the red fl red flags on other people and um that we've talked about and are totally just they here's sit on those right. yeah. yeah yeah or they don't see them they just sit on those and squat and go this person did this and i know they did you know it's like for don wells i'm under the impression he didn't have anything to do with that but some people are like, yeah, he's a horrible guy. They keep bringing up all this other stuff that has nothing to yeah. do with what they're talking about. So that, but that, this last one, the, or the the Cleo Smith one, that was a that was a good one actually, because it was because a lot anybody can get on here and go, yeah, we know he's lying because he's doing this. How hard is that, you know? So that's why people come up with that shoulder thing and the itch in the nose or whatever that and all the you know, all that stuff. But I think it was a good one because we didn't know. And we've done that a couple of times now, I think. Yep. So yep, I think we did. Right. Yeah, so we didn't know, and then being able to see uh, what was happening, and still make our um, diagnosis of the situation uh, the way we always do, you know, and scored on that one. So that was uh, that was good. A lot so, of people were so against what we were talking about. Oh yeah, they're still they're still attacking, and I'm just like, yeah, I, I can't spend time when you got ten thousand comments. You're just not going to get to that. Man. A couple of things while we're talking about it. let's talk about culture because i think that's an important part and all when we say culture if you think about every person who doesn't have a disability can make all the same movements with their body you know, some people are more talented at things than others but we all are capable of making things then about at some age little kid walks around waving his middle finger or those two fingers or some symbol that means something in your culture and you go stop that stop that now and that's culture culture starts pairing our ability to do things a very famous salute and i'll think i'll forget the name of it i always do but um the guy who wrote the national Ant or the uh, pledge of allegiance used to have children standing doing the roman salute with their hands up in the air one hand up in the air and then nazis came along and that went away 
overnight. So culture changes everything. And so you have to look for cultural nuance. It's why when you're in the Middle East, you know, you notice people are not using their left hand as much. They make more eye contact. It might not mean anything. So you have to take all that into account. And then microculture is even impacted. And that's what we were looking at with all of that. Yeah. Here's one from Kate Gravitt. And, and she says, uh, how often do you trust your gut? I find when I ignore mine, it bites me in the butt later. Well, your gut's really, really, really important. But at the same time, you've got to take what you're seeing um, from a clinical aspect, from an analytical aspect in, into consideration as well. Because some people can really make you, uh, as a charismatic, they can make you feel a certain way as you speak with them and talk to them. But, and that totally clouds your, it knocks the things you're looking for out of the way. So your gut is really important. It really is, especially if they're in danger situations. That's a whole other. That's a whole other thing. Like that book um, that, that I'm that I'm always telling people to get is uh, the gift of fear. So every woman that Becker. watches this should get that book. Yeah, Gavin DeBecker, great book. Talks about what we're talking about. But your gut is really important. But when it comes to interrogation and watching these videos uh, about people who are in they're in question of what they've done or haven't done something, gut's important, but. The more analytical part of it is more important. I think you got to kind of get the, you know, put the two together. But it's kind of dangerous just to, in these situations, to trust just your gut. But out in the world, out in the wild, we're talking about something that might hurt you, or this is, might be a bad situation. That's completely different. Go with your gut. If it feels wrong, it probably is wrong. But whether somebody's lying to you or not, just going on your guts not is not the not the way to go. I wouldn't think. What do you think, Greg? Yeah, no, here's what I would say. Your gut is designed to protect you. That part's a great thing, and there you go. But the thing you also have to be careful with is all your biases are tied up in your gut because they're 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 balled up in there. And so your first incl inclination, and I, by nature, am a person who trusts my gut but verifies, trust but verify. What you got to know is that all the times that you're making a gut decision, it's based on a lot of things in your past. If you've always been wrong and you're still using your gut, something's wrong. I and mean, that's the best I can tell you is I try to disprove my gut. Now, in a life and death situation, I don't try to disprove anything. But when I'm interviewing somebody, I'm trying to disprove myself all along the way. Okay, you ready for this one? <laughs> sure, sure. Check this out. Some Va Valerie Stauffer, and she says, she, her question is, Greg says, says, I'm all arms and legs. Greg appears taller than Scott in pictures, and Scott looks shorter than Dr. Phil. So my guess is Scott is 6'2", and Greg is 6'4". Am I close? Yes, you nailed it. I'm six two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've got arms like, I've got arms like a gorilla. Yeah, yeah, no yeah monkey kidding. arms. I got 30 when I, when I went to wardrobe, I, I looked at the lady and she says, what size shirt do you wear? And I told her, and she said, are you sure? And I raised my arm. She said, yeah, you're sure. Because I'm, I've got long limbs, really long limbs. I'm, I'm about a perfect measuring stick for six foot tall. That's it. Yeah. I am six feet tall. And Greg, you're about, you're six feet too, right? We're about the same size, right? Yeah. I'm maybe a little over, just a little, but not much. Yep. Huh. So we're almost okay. exactly the same height. Most of the time you see me, if I'm in jeans, I'm also in cowboy boots. So I'm in heels. That's is it. Dr. Phil taller than us? No, no, I don't think so. Maybe. I don't know. He's a big guy. He's right guy. at six. Maybe he might be six one. Oh, he's a big boy. He may be taller. He's a big guy. He's a big he's guy. He's got that. I used to be a, I used to, when I was young, he's got that look to him. When you, when you see him in person on TV, he's all nice. And, well, he's not all nice and stuff, but he's, and he's a great guy. Don't get me wrong. But you can still tell he's got that thing where he's whipped a few hind ends in his time, I think. He's got that look to him. Thank you, Adele, for not thinking I look mean. It it depends on how I what my face looks like at the moment. Probably when, when I'm yeah. talking, I look friendlier. In that in that last behavior panel stuff, man, you're just sitting there like this the whole time, emotionless. Yeah. yeah. Sadie Sadie asks a great question. Does the good cop bad cop routine actually work? Absolutely, it works wonderfully. <laughs> watch it, yeah. watch Doctor Phil. <laughs> yeah. Well, the screaming and yelling piece. Anytime someone's screaming and yelling and doing all of that stuff, it's unless they're just not good at the job, it's to get your thinking brain turned off so that other things can happen. One of my best buddies is a counterintelligence guy we'll talk to here shortly. We'll do what, an interview with. And he would always say, you know, anytime I see you doing that, I'm wondering what's going on behind the scenes because I know you're working some other approach. You're working some other ploy and you're just trying to get them off balance. And then you bring in another person. If you don't think it works, Somebody has posted an old History Channel show out here in the community with me in it. Go watch that because the way we broke 
the first story is we took a guy and he went in and blooded his knuckles on the wall, swilled some beer around in his mouth and went and talked to this kid and said, you're going to talk to me or whatever, and went after him pretty hard, you know, aggressively, not physically. And then Dora, one of the best interrogators and one of the best questioners I've ever known, broke this kid with a cookie. It just worked. So you, what we know is you're looking for friendly and you can't often tell the difference. Here's a good Dora one. certainly was not his friend. <laughs> Here's one from uh, Bridget Veach, and she says, she asks, she says, who is an easier person to teach body language to, someone who learned it from necessity or someone who is learning for the first time? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Wow. It's, I think somebody who's learned it for the first time in, in a lot of ways, because it's, if you're already into body language and you're, and, and you've, you're in business and you've been using it and what you think is correct for a long time, it's kind of like, I'm not a golfer, but a guy named Sean Glinter, a buddy, one of my best friends, told me about this. And he said, I see what's going on here. And I said, okay, what? because I was having a problem at the Entrepreneur Center teaching this guy to act the way, to um, transmit what he should transmit body language-wise. And he said, this is like golf. I said, how's this like golf? He said, because if, you're, if you've been golfing for years and years and years, and then you have a pro come in and go, here's how you really do a good, a better swing. He said, throws your game for like, you know, two months. But then when you, get a, uh, when you get used to it and learn how to do it, then it just takes off. So on one hand, it's good to know, um, have somebody who, who's familiar with stuff because you can talk to them um, about things and it doesn't hurt their feelings. You say, I see what you're doing here, but this is wrong and here's why. But the person who's just learning it, man, they usually are really quiet and, they, and the questions they ask are the, the beginner's questions. What about this? Why, and, you can, and you can start actually teaching them something from the word go. That was my favorite part, seeing somebody actually learning something. And then come back years later and go, man, I've been using this and I use it all the time and, and here's how it's helped. And you hear these stories about how they've, yep. not just in their business stuff, but in life as well, how they get things done. Greg, what about you? Yeah, I'll, I'll use one quick sentence I've used in interrogation and everywhere else I've ever been a teacher. It's harder to unteach than it is to teach. And when people have bad habits, it's just what you were just saying. Then you get to the other piece. Hey, I wanted to answer a question from John where you ask, uh, we have said in the past we're not big fans of Myers-Briggs, now we're talking about it. I think Myers-Briggs, any of these tools, I, I don't put a whole lot of faith in are they 100% accurate in terms of who a person is because they're self-reported, number one. But number two, it doesn't matter. It gives you a way to talk about people. And whatever that system is, and everybody's got one, like I said earlier, things like DISC and those that business uses. I've even, I even have my own I put in a book about how to get people to help, whether they are willing helpers, they want to be told to help, they want to force to help, those kinds of things. So building a profile of a way to talk about somebody is why those tools matter, not because they're 100% accurate or they have any psychological meaning, or because as you're reporting things yourself, you're going to you're going to, first of all, cheat the test. Most of us do. So that's just my thoughts as we get into that one. A couple people, Maria, Valerie I'll post and John. some pictures of horses. Oh, yeah. You got to do that, horses. dude. Put those in there. Yeah. I've, I've got a ton of them. So I'll post some pictures. I'll show you. I'm riding a big blue roan mare right now that I think is the prettiest horse I've ever owned. So. Valerie and John both said Dr. Phil is 6'3". He, I told he, you, I think maybe that's why guy. he has that. Yeah. Oh, I know he's a big guy. He's a big dude, but I'm. But he always seems so nice. But but he still has that thing on him where you can tell if he needs to scrap. He's a little scrappy, I think. You know, if you need to get yeah. into it, he could. The reason I know for a fact is, you know, we went 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 over to his house and I got to. We were talking cars. Scott took a picture of me in the car with him. We're sitting there talking cars. He's got a '57 Chevy, and he's had the seat moved back. So I knew he was pretty tall because I was like, man, I yeah. like what you've done with the seat here. So Scott's looking at us like, what the hell are you talking about? Oh, man, Looking that was the stuff. worst nerd out I've ever seen. About I don't know anything <laughs> about cars. I know where you put the gas in, how to turn one on and how to stop it and how to make it go with that pedal down there on the bottom. That's And make it go backwards. I can go backwards in them. That's it. And these guys, to a nauseous level of detail about a car from the 50s, it's like... <laughs> oh, it was, it was, it was just so, uh, let's move on. Let's see. Uh, do you ever, uh, let's see, uh, Marlene asks, do you ever suspect someone is lying to you during baseline questions? Is there any way to control or account for that? Yeah, sometimes you do. Greg, you, you go first on that. Yeah, one. yeah. So in, in interrogation, we'll bring, pi well, we did bring pile on. Control questions are exactly that. A control question needs to be something you know the answer to, and you pepper your baselining with questions you know the answer, or they have no reason to lie. You know, the reason I always use a contrived question with eye movement around fifth word of the Star Spangled Banner is I know the answer, so you can't lie. But 
A good way to do that, I've found in business, is when I walk into somebody's office and they have the I love me wall up behind them, and you've got pictures of you know this whole, this golf course or that kind of thing, I'll ask them about that. They have no reason to lie to me about that, and you get a baseline from them. It's usually asking a control question. Now, you, you can't just ask a random question. You don't know whether they're telling the truth or not. How about you, Scott? Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. That's why the more information you know about that person when you go in, the better off you're going to be. So you can ask them if, for example, if, if you used to live in Boston, because I used to live in Boston, so I could say, do you know where um, a certain restaurant is or this place or that place, right? But if I like Yanni's Pizza, you know where Yanni's is? If they didn't know where that was, if, the, if, if they said they did, it's not Yanni's Pizza anymore. There's a, that's in uh, the section where we lived because it's, it's a whole restaurant now, right? So if they said, yeah, I, I know Yanni's, I know they wouldn't know Yanni's. But I ask them about stuff that they should know about or that they could possibly know about and things I'm just making up so I can see how they... And you know that statue that used to be outside of Yanny's, just right down there to the left, next to the video place. That what was that? What was that? And they'll they'll say, I don't, rem- I don't, rem- I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure about that one. Or they go, Yeah, I know. I don't remember. You know. So you get that. That's how. That's how I go about going to baseline. I, I find out as much as I can about them and start asking them questions about stuff or where they lived, not just where they worked and that kind of thing, but where they lived. One of the best. One of the best examples of somebody who was good at that I ever met was a guy named Don Landrum. We're going to bring Don on. Don is was my mentor at Sear, and he was a guy called a bearded one that we used to say gave everybody nightmares. Big, big, big man, but also really aggressive in the compound. And he could ask you enough questions about your hometown to make you feel stupid. He didn't have to know the answers is the key. he just ask until you ran out of answers and then say, it doesn't matter. And that's a powerful tool when a person thinks you know more than they do. Then they start giving you information. So what should I, Stephen Goldman asks, what should I emphasize about body language training when writing my resume? Be careful. Be careful. Yeah. Because remember, people that don't know anything about body language think it's smoke and mirrors, voodoo and that kind of thing. And just I think what's an important part is learning. I would emphasize the fact you're learning about how humans communicate and, you know, on more than one channel, something like that. I wouldn't call out the words body language or that kind of thing. I would talk about yeah. putting effort and time into learning how to communicate more effectively, as Mark always says, you know? Yeah, yeah. Plus, you don't want anybody to know that you're studying body language. That's the thing. It's not It's not something you go and say, hey, we are. We say, oh, I'm, a, I'm an expert. Here's what I do, because that's what we, we make a living. But out in the wild, that's not the first thing I say. Good Lord, no. Because you don't want people to know that you do that, that you that you can get a better idea of what's happening in a communication setting than anyone else, because they'll start acting weird. I don't go out and have lunch and coffee with a whole bunch of people, just very few. That's it, because nobody wants to hang out with us. It sounds like it would be fun for about an hour. And then after that, you're like, eh, it's really not that exciting. And other people don't want to do it because they think you're reading their body language the whole time. We're not. You know? (laughs) Yeah, so Kristen asked a great question. What's the best best way to perfect your elevator statement? You know, if you watch us every time we open our behavior panel, we all have our little tagline. And I think it's just a matter of what do you want people to take away? So I use all my, I, I don't mention, I've got 20 years in business and operating partner in a firm, that kind of thing, because it doesn't matter to the audience. What matters to the audience is that I have my credentials from the military to learn the body language and the behavior. So just figure out, number one, what's the little box that you want people to put you in? Because that's what you're doing when you do it. The reason we, each of us call out our thing is we're putting a mailbox in your head to put us into for how you watch us and we inform you. That's the best way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because who wants to hire somebody to go interrogate somebody who is a record producer? What if I came on and said, yeah, I'm a body language expert and analyst. I've been nominated for Grammys, and I've sold millions and millions and millions of records as a producer. What do you think about that? You know, really? <laughs> what do you do? I'm an operating do do... partner in a firm. You, 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 yeah. <laughs> does it, yeah. So nobody, nobody wants, wants to know to that. It. Yeah, you want that. You want a specialist. That's what you want, you know. Yeah. So that's why you go. Oh, I see. And everybody that's in business has these other things that they do. But they say, "Here's what I do. I do this one thing." Yes. And now I'm not. In, I'm not doing music stuff at all. I just do this. So I can say that now. But 
Yeah, you don't want somebody who's doing all kinds of different things. You don't, you don't, you know, if you're going to get your your heart looked at, you don't want some guy who's like a golf pro and then he's like a, an eye pro, and, you know, the eye specialist and the ear specialist and the elbow specialist and a heart specialist too. I want some nerd who's like all up into the heart, man. That's the guy I'd want. I want I want that guy. It's all he thinks about. It's all he dreams about. He talks to his wife about it till she's sick of him almost. That's the guy I want. So that's the person you want who's all obsessed with what they're doing. So that's why we have our, our here's what I do. It's the same every time. Mark's, you know, shoot, I could do it in my sleep. I can answer the phone and answer that instead of saying hello. I could say. He's got, it. He's got that one perfect. Georgina yeah. says, from the community before the live, a guy asked about the eyebrow, about one single eyebrow twitch rise when you're talking to someone. So we have to, let's first of all say, if it's a baseline and he does it all the time, it means nothing. Scott sent me a picture of a guy one time who did this the whole time he's talking. It means nothing. But if it does it at a specific time, we usually associate a single eyebrow raise with skepticism. Or it can be contempt if the whole face rises, but with skepticism typically is a one eyebrow rise. Uh, what are the ages of the behavior panel? <laughs> I'm the old guy. Yeah, Greg's the old one. I'm 58. You're, you're 59. Yeah, but no, I'll be 60 is, in May. I'll be 60 How in old May. is Mark? I, I don't know. Mark's 50-ish is my guess. Chase is 40-ish. So Yeah, yeah. It's weird we don't know that. We should know that, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I'll but be 60 in May. Okay. Well, I told you I did 20 years of military time and then 20 years in corporate America. So, you know, I'm getting pretty close. Uh, let's see. Greg, what's your favorite car to drive? Adele wants to know. Fast ones. <laughs> of of my cars ride. are fast ones. <laughs> if you ever meet Greg and you go, yeah, and, you get, and he's like, after you finish talking, he goes, where are you going? Oh, I'm just going up to the hotel. I'll give you a ride. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't. It scares me to death. Don't get in a car with him. I'm not kidding. For with 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 all seriousness, Greg, you know I feel That's this funny. way. Don't. That's funny. Somebody somebody asked me. I, yeah, I do have an old car, but I also have a, a modern car that's fast and fun to drive, and that's the one Scott hates. Yeah. So. Oh man. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, let's see. Let's find a good one on here. Uh, is that is um, the fifty eight Impala? That's the question. Was that the, yeah? That, I, have, it, I have a fifty eight Impala. It's a it's a pretty car. It's I've only had it about a year. Still working on it. It's the wow. it's I'll geek on it real bad. Scott Scott hates cars. He's not a car guy. But I just yeah, don't know anything car. about I it. Up last year. I've got a traverse. <laughs> Doctor Phil started making fun of my traverse as well. Yeah, he tells you have a station wagon with big wheels. That's basically what it is. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, here's one from uh, I... Charity. Oh, go ahead. What do you got? Yeah. Somebody says, w Jim says, why do I get a bad feeling about someone using too many illustrators, but not really saying anything of substance? Because they look like politicians is why you, you get that feeling. No kidding. And you don't feel like they're trustworthy because they're a product when they're doing that. That's why. Like you're selling. I, I, guys, I do any tomorrow. I don't care which. Which group of people calls me and asks me to talk about politicians? I'll go in and talk about their body language and how they're moving and talking because it's all about show. And that's what you're sensing when, when you see all that. And they may at their core mean something, but they have to keep 51% of people happy. So they have to have a show for you. Yeah. Charity, uh, Charity Burnett uh, asks, uh, good morning, Scott and Greg. Hi. Uh, what interview techniques do you admire with media icons like Oprah Winfrey, Diane Sawyer, Joe Rogan, the late Larry King, or Johnny Carson? Man, I'll tell you what. Joe Rogan's I really like because he does not care. He's just talking to somebody. Doesn't really care. Now, Johnny Carson had it down. He had – it was a structure to what he did, and he did everything so well. Depending on what, kind, on what person he was talking to and what part of, of entertainment they were in or whatever, he's really good too. But I like Oprah's because – she boy, she she'll make it light, but then she'll squish right in there and get to the stinging part really good. And that that we and and what's that woman's name from the uh, um, Gail King? Who's oh man, I think she's awesome. I really like her. So so what I would say, Charity, is any of them that put people at ease before they start the conversation. And I I think Oprah's masterful at that. Whether you like or yeah. don't like Oprah, guys, we know that people don't like everybody. And so I but. People who are good at putting somebody at ease and who are good at what they do, 
any of those. I mean, to me, I don't have to like their politics because it doesn't matter. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. I don't have to like any of that. I like watching somebody who is masterful at getting information. And it usually what they're doing is what we do. Establish rapport, establish control. It's just a, a process. Here's one. Here's one from Kathy. You, um, you are both adorable. And then it's, she says, I was looking at a photo of Scott with Dr. Phil and his wife, Robin. Uh, her body language is definitely showing attraction to Scott. She's like that. She's really um, um, charismatic. She's dynamic. She's yeah, dynamic. Oh, man. Yep. Yeah. You'd love her. Because uh, cause my wife it, thinks she's awesome, too. But once you meet her, you go, holy smokes. This is, she really, she, she really, she's the sweetest thing in the whole world. But I, but I think she makes everybody feel what you're seeing there. She makes everybody feel that way. At their house, at the their at the very show nice. in the she's office nice. all that really nice <laughs> what do you got I, I, this is a great show for me Marie I might even be able to get a sponsor when, when you two take traveling Bigfoot interrogation show on the road you got to do it in a different cool old restored car for every episode we'd be like comedians in cars except way better yeah except for Scott would be white knuckling holding on while I'm driving oh yeah you, you could see I'll go with if it. you want to see Scott's scared face just let him ride with me <sighs> Good Lord. You know, we oh, we got to do something on Bigfoot, man. It keeps coming up. It's Greg's favorite thing. It's, it's well, yeah, <laughs> the cool thing is Twitter, on Twitter, I've got Bigfoot hunters now DMing me and telling me, hey, I said, I, hey, they welcome. Exist. I'm going to bring one of them on because people are telling me Bigfoot does exist. I said, cool. If you want to come on the show. We got to do it, man. Get you on. Let's get yeah. us one. Let's get us one. Let's get a bunch of them. Oh, what we need to do. Oh, no. No. Okay. Well, I'll tell you later. I got an idea. Anna asks, so if you like fast cars, Greg, how, how often have you used your body language skills to get out of a speeding ticket? When you look like me, you don't talk yourself out of speeding tickets very often. <laughs> They're just you, you protect yourself from them. You get lots of apparatus so you don't get pulled over. Let's see here. Let's do a couple more and we'll get off here. Yeah. We got things that we got stuff to do. Um... Let's see. Hannah, you ask a great question. How long did it take you both to trust what you see and not always doubt yourself? Well, you know what? Doubt is a good thing. It means that you double check. Some things just stand out. But remember, we just did this with with Cleo's parents. You have to double check sometimes. Sometimes things mean something and sometimes they don't. You know, there's some universals. If you start with Ekman, with Paul Ekman, and you look at his universal facial expressions that the brain is controlling and you have no conscious control over, that's a different thing. You can rely on those. But the others, yeah, you just got to be careful. Um. Janina asks, guys, we're so used to seeing you all on screen, but have you ever been in a real room together? If not, do you have any plans and what you drinking? Well, I'm not we do plan to get guys. together. <laughs> Three of us have been together. That's it. No, two of us have been together at a time. Uh, well, we've I've all never, met each other, except I've we've never met Mark. You've never been in the face same room face. with Mark? Not he's tall, face. man. Mark's yeah, a big, big boy. Guy. Yeah. Me and uh, Chase and I were in, where did we? We were in uh, North, North Carolina, Carolina and then somewhere else. And we were in Nashville. And then uh, I met Mark in Nashville. I mean, in person. And then, but yeah, I think the most we've ever been together is two of us at a time, right? That's right. Yep. Wow. All right, let's hit one or two more, and then we'll close out because we got an interview to do. Because of you, too. Let's see. Jamie says, because of you, too, I see Dr. Phil differently. Actually, I see everything differently. Thanks. Yeah, the thing about Dr. Phil, once you get to hang around for about 30 minutes, he's just some dude. Retired police officer David Polites, like his last name, would be a great conversation with you concerning Bigfoot, missing persons, everything in between. You guys know him. Ah, Bridget, that's a great a great name a great question i'm going to screen capture that so we can look into him uh k asked what's the best way to maximize the value of a 20 minute one-on-one -on -one zoom session with you both just any what what is it you want to know when you come in just some of us just sit and talk if you just want to sit and talk about yeah. nothing we're happy with that but if you got if you got something in mind write it down so you remember what you want to talk about and then just say hey here's what i want to talk about and 
remember tell us how much depth you want because it depends on the topic we can deep dive pretty hard That's yeah the thing yeah to and some and like this weekend i'll be going through and, and doing and greg you can do these with me or you can do them yourself because what we've been doing is going and saying hey i'm going to be in here for 30 minutes the first five people to come in will sit around and talk and those have been actually fun so because yeah. the other ones that we put up were the one-on-ones man they go so quick but we can't put in any more because we don't have any more time um yeah Okay, so if you want to, I, I know people watching on YouTube. We forgot to tell you to, to join the membership. So if you want to, if you want to come in and get your questions answered and a lot more stuff, go to bodylanguagemembership.com. Just go take a look at the video there and look at that at what we do in the membership because you'll probably really like it if you like what we're doing on in this video. So go take a look bodylanguagemembership.com, and we really appreciate y'all being here. And everybody, yeah, thanks, we'll guys. see you. Yeah, one last thing before we roll off here. What we do behind there is there are, there's an academy where we give you lots of training. We give you elements of almost everything we've ever done. We've got classes in there you can go and attend. There's a discussion forum. There's a book club. People are going back and forth and talking about books monthly. Um, we do book reviews. As a matter of fact, we're about to do two today, and then we bring in people to the interrogation room from our past. So far, we've had some pretty interesting folks. I think we had a couple of others coming in who are active military folks, just retiring military folks, a guy who's an investigator. And it's civil discussion. Lots of people talking and have opinions, but stay civil and everything works great. Join us. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for being with us. And Greg, I'm sure I'll see you in the next few minutes when we get off of here. I'm so. sure. Take care. All right.